You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Formerly, you're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Each week on the show, I talk about biohacking, the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you so that you have full control of your own biology. But our guest today is legendary and has spent decades understanding how humans are all interconnected with each other, how you fit into the world. He's an absolute pioneer, a visionary, a philosopher, and that barely scratches the surface of his work in the world. I'm talking about none other than Ken Wilbur. Ken, welcome. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to be with you. Ken, you're known, uh, and I think for listeners, many of us have heard of Integral Theory, which I would say is a North Star for Seekers of Knowledge. And you've written a bunch of books like A Theory of Everything, Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, and your newest book, Finding Radical Wholeness, is coming out soon. So you're not slowing down. If anything, you're accelerating your writing, right? Yeah, Yeah, it's... it's, um, it's one of the things that when I look back on my career, I'm sort of happiest about. Um, so I can, I've written like over 30 books and they're all in my bookshelf and I can see them all and <laughs> that's great. Um, but I do notice that I have sort of increased the frequency with which I write. And, and that's a little bit odd to me because I would, sort of just naturally think that I would sort of slow down a little bit. Um, I mean, I'm 74 years old now. And so, um, but I, I, it just seems to sort of increase. And in part, it's because I continue to think of different ways to explain the general ideas. And I seem to think of different ways to explain it with a fairly rapid amount of turnover. And so I'll finish one book, and I actually have another way that I can say essentially the same stuff. Um, So I'll finish one book, and then usually I'll wait like three or four months, and then I'll start the next book. Um. And that's just kind of continued, and I'm very pleased with it. Um, I like the different outputs that I've produced and the different types of explanations. Um, And I've continued to discover different aspects of human beings that can be approached in a more holistic and whole mind way. So I now include growing up, waking up, opening up, cleaning up, and showing up. And each of those refer to a different type of wholeness that you can have. So just to give a simple example, um, if, say, a thousand years ago, when it was thought that the Earth went around the sun, and the earth itself was flat, and we didn't have any understanding of atoms, molecules, or cells. You could be studying like Zen or some meditative practice, and maybe you're walking through the woods one day, and you're aware of the sun out there, and you're aware of the earth down there, and you're aware of all the trees in the forest. And all of a sudden, you can have an actual unity experience. So you don't see the sun anymore. You are one with the sun. And you don't see all the trees. You're one with all the trees. And you don't feel the earth underneath your feet. You are one with the earth. But the fact that you're one with the sun or one with the earth or one with the trees won't give you any understanding of the atoms that are fundamental components of each of those. And they won't give you an understanding of the molecules that atoms fundamentally build. And they won't give you any understanding of cells that are in each of the trees. But you don't have any understanding of the cells. And that's what the molecules 
tend to create. And then, of course, there are multicellular organisms. And we have a whole tree of life that includes fish, uh, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, humans. And each one of those gets more complex. And increased complexity can lead to an increased wholeness. If you draw them all together into a unified whole, those wholes become greater the more complex they are. And so none of that is obvious. And yet each one of them can give us a different type of actual wholeness. And when we become aware of this wholeness, we actually experience this unity with whether it's the planets or the universe or the earth or all the organic molecules and trees and animals and so on. Um, and, and this increased feeling of wholeness is a very satisfying because it's a very filling experience. And um, so that's why generally people like to call themselves holistic because that's another word for whole. And people like to, to be whole. They don't want to be fragmented and broken and split. They want to be whole and unified. And that's essentially what my writing is about, is how to discover all of these areas of unification, whether that's growing up or waking up or opening up or cleaning up or showing up. Okay. What was the first time in your life you experienced that sense of wholeness? Tell me the story about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was in my early teens, maybe 12 or 13, and I was meditating because I'd been doing Zen practice since I was about 10 or 11. And as I sat down and started to concentrate on a topic, and at the time I was concentrating on a Zen koan called Mu. And Mu, M-U, is the Japanese word that simply means no. And it's become one of the most widely prescribed koan exercises for the largest number of Zen students because a famous Japanese Zen master by the name of Joshu was asked, does a dog have Buddha nature? And every Buddhist knows that all sentient animals have some degree of consciousness. So the correct answer would be yes. But Joshu famously screamed, moo, meaning no. And the Zen koan is, why did he say no? And you basically, the way you theoretically do that is you concentrate on Mu until there's no separation between you and Mu itself. So you become one with that mental object or subject and object become one. And that oneness permeates your entire life and you become one with everything you experience is out there. So you become one with the universe, one with the forest, one with the earth, one with everything that you're experiencing as a separate object. And that's what happened to me. I was meditating on Mu and then... When you were 12? When, I'm sorry? When you were 12, you were meditating on Mu? Uh, 12 or 13, yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, so you were into this as a kid? Uh, yes, I was. And I right. started meditating, like when I, I said about 10 or 11. And I would do that because when I found out about Zen, and because I read the books of D.T. Suzuki, which is the sort of the leading Zen scholar of the time, and he wrote books, like three-volume books called Essays in Zen Buddhism. And when I first read Essays in Zen Buddhism, I couldn't help but notice this term Satori. Because that's what Zen was all about, was getting a Satori. And a Satori is a Japanese word that just means unity experience. Mm 
And so you have a Satori when you feel one with the entire universe or one with everything that's arising. And that's what happened is I it medit- continued to meditate on Mu. And I'd been meditating on Mu for a year or two by then, which is usually it takes a couple of years to crack through to the unity of Mu. Wow. And so I, I was about normal progress for somebody who's practicing Zen. And I just became one with Mu. And that meant I wasn't thinking about Mu. I was simply was Mu. And whether I was thinking about Mu or not, there was just this unity of Mu-ness. And I was one with that unity. And that was a profound awakening for me. It was such a strong sense of unity and wholeness and oneness, wherever I looked and whatever I felt. And so my separate self-sense, the separate can that was aware of all of this stuff going on out there, there wasn't any can left. There was just everything out there, and I was one with all of it. And that's the feeling of satori, or awakening, or ultimate oneness. And that was a very, very important direct experience for me. And it changed my view of religion entirely, because religion used to be something that people would think or something that they would do, like prayer or something like that. And so there was a subject-object differentiation between the subject that believes in religion and the religion itself. But this wasn't like that. This was, I wasn't separate from spirituality. I was one with that spiritual realization. And that oneness just completely turned over everything that I learned about religion up to that point. And of course, I had also started, because of my meditation practice, I would started studying the works of like Aldous Huxley and Alan Watts and people that wrote about direct spiritual experience or direct spiritual unity or oneness or wholeness. So I was very much aware that those types of oneness experiences were the core of spirituality. They were the core wow. of you had a Christ consciousness experience of oneness or God conscious experience of oneness or unity awareness or Zen Satori. They all carried this unitary experiential realization. Okay. And that was a very profound change in my theoretical understanding. uh, And how does it feel that today people would count, they would add your name to that list of of masters with Aldous Huxley and people like that? I mean, mean, it's, I'm terrifically honored by it. Um, And I'm very glad that I have been able to write over 30 books that, each of them has been a, a, a essentially a bestseller. And um, so I'm glad that I found ways to word this understanding in a way that a lot of people seem to appreciate and they can yeah. seem to understand it. And that makes me feel great. It, it's a gift. It, it's a gift to know the states. It's another gift to be able to somehow share them. I, I do it with neurofeedback. Uh, at my my neurofeedback company, uh, and I I write books as well. I've I've written yeah, eight like bulletproof diet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a good book, book, by the way. Oh, thank you. That, that I like is it. It's a huge honor. <laughs> yeah, it's a great uh, book. Oh, uh, thank you. And and the idea is to, to somehow share some knowledge that people don't have, and that seems like much harder than gaining it. But you you've trodden some new paths. And you talked about the yeah. first time at a very young age you experienced this. The only other one who comes to mind like that is uh, uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar uh, was on the right. show a little while ago. And when he was three, he memorized the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, 
you know, the, he, he beat you by a few years. But I mean, th- these are unusual things for a 10 or 12 year old or uh, to do or uh, anyone who's still a kid. Uh, so you got into it early. Do you think that's because of some past life you came in semi enlightened or something? Or like, what, what's your story about why you did this so young? Yeah. I was just born with an intense intellectual curiosity. Curiosity. Okay. That keeps and you young. I just too, wanted to know whenever I yeah. study, I come across a new idea. And whether it was something like the perennial philosophy or unity consciousness or Christ consciousness, I'd want to know what is that. And so as soon as I started reading D.T. Suzuki and like essays in Zen Buddhism, he was such a clear, beautiful writer. And when he would talk about Satori, he was talking like it was the most precious gift that humankind had. And I just had to know what that was about. Um, and so I started reading all the people that had written about some type of spiritual unity. And that included like Aldous Huxley and D.T. Suzuki and Alan Watts and Christian Murdy and a whole long list. And I stumbled on something called the perennial philosophy. And that was the great philosophers of many cultures, uh, uh, and, and there are an enormous number of philosophers that have had these awakening experiences. And the sum total of them was called the perennial philosophy. Because once you've had this experience, you tend, everybody that has the experience tends to feel similar things. So they no longer feel like they're a separate self-sense. They've transcended the separate self-sense. So all of Buddhism, for example, is known as a no-self religion. And that's because all of them have had this Satori-like experience. And therefore, their separate self has just disappeared. And they feel one with everything that's arising. And... So I knew theoretically that those type of experiences were there. And once I knew they were there, I, of course, wanted to have one. And since I started reading D.T. Suzuki and Aldous Huxley and that, when I was quite young, I was eight or nine or ten when I started to read the perennial philosophy. So Nanda Kumar Swami, Aldous Huxley, and all of these great perennial philosophical writers, many of them I had fully studied and read. So as I began practicing what they talked about, and I began using a Zen koan, And for people that don't know, a Zen koan is a saying of a famous Zen master, and they're used as objects of meditation. So if you are assigned a koan, most Renzai Zen masters assign their students a koan. And it might be, they're usually questions or stories that don't make much rational sense. So a famous Zen koan is, what's the sound of one hand clapping? And you actually meditate on the sound of one hand clapping until you become that sound. And it's a very real experiential realization. And How long long does it normally take when you're meditating on the sound of one hand clapping? Is that another two-year experience? Um, Yeah. (laughs) about two years (laughs) i've been interested i've been interested in ways to get to those states faster i mean i'm I'm using neuroscience and lasers and and sounds and lights and all the things and you've you've got you are a master of this is there a faster way than to just meditate in a cave for two years on the one hand clapping what's your fastest way yeah um electromagnetic brain stimulation Yes, it's I do. definitely the <laughs> quickest of all the paths out there. And anybody can buy a brain mind machine. They're everywhere. I mean, you can get online and find, just type in brain mind machine and you'll find hundreds of them. And um, 
they generally use um, a type of neuro-linguistic programming where if you play something that's like eight hertz in the right ear and four hertz in the left ear, your brain will start to focus on the difference between them. Right. So it'll focus on a four hertz brain wave. Right, and a four is hertz is yeah. a very deep theta state. So it's a state of, yet yeah, we generally have waking, dreaming, and deep formless sleep. And four hertz is a deep formless state. And that generally we know from the brain states that we've actually studied of real Zen meditators that the lower megahertz wavelengths, such as two, three, four, five hertz, are where most of the deep dreamless or so-called causal, which is ultimate reality type of experiences, tend to occur in those very slow wave states. And when you buy a brain mind machine and just put it on your head and set whatever speeds you want, it'll create these two different wavelengths that you'll hear and your brain will actually focus on the difference between the speed of those wavelengths. So if you have a 10 hertz going in one ear and a 5 hertz going in the other, your brain will focus on the difference between 5 and 10, which itself is 5 hertz. And that's a fairly low state. And of course, you can set your brain mind machine to 1 megahertz or two megahertz or three megahertz and and it'll send the correct amount of different wavelengths into your brain and instead of taking like one or two years to yourself get into that state the brain mind machine will put you in that state in in less than an hour wow so they're very effective, and I, I recommend them, definitely. They're terrific for just somebody who wants to try them once a day or something like right. that, and you will definitely get in those states very quickly. I, I started using that kind of machine uh, probably when I was 20 years old, right. uh, which for me is 30 years ago. And today, uh, BrainTap is probably the most common one people have heard of on this show because I, because I've interviewed the founder. Right. I've also used the electrical currents flowing between the ears right. uh, in those same states. In fact, I wrote the Bulletproof Diet with electricity uh, right. running between my ears, putting me in a gamma state, uh, which uh, is also right. associated with advanced meditation. So, you know, as a when you're kind of downloading and organizing and going into these altered states of creation to write a really good book, I found that helped a lot. You ever run electricity directly over your brain? You almost must have. Sure. Um, well, it produces the desired state very quickly. Um, and that's because it's, it's applying a direct current to your brain. Yeah. And that's a very uh, powerful, explicit way to do it. And I, did you have good luck when you tried it? I did, but it requires having the right equipment. And we do it sometimes even at 40 years of Zen, but it's clinical grade gear. Um, right. I was lucky. I had a, a piece of equipment that was very programmable. You know, they made 2,000 of these things. And then the guy making them turned out uh, apparently to, to run a, a con because he just kept selling them but never shipping them for the next generation oh. of it. So I have one of these units so I was maybe 15 years ahead of where things are today. So today we have clinical grade ones and you put the electrodes in the right places and you can, you can profoundly change someone's state. I uh, even have an experimental one where something like 6% of people who use it experience God, like, like they call it the God helmet. I don't use that one clinically. Um, it's, it's very finicky and you have to check the space weather before you can use it. But you know, people have really profound things. So I, I just realizing you can access these these states with breath work, uh, with electricity. And for me, the biggest one has been focusing on open heartedness, gratitude, and forgiveness. And that's at the core of what I teach at 40 years of Zen. But it, to me, that all feels heart-based. And, and you talk about the mind, I talk about the mind. 
Talk with me about the Ken Wilbur perspective on what does the mind do versus what the heart does? Well, one of the most important things when you have a so-called heart experience is the lack of duality. I mean, it's just inherently a unified state. Right. And so Zen will say, although Zen does talk about big mind versus small mind. So Suzuki was famous for his big mind talks. Um, And that's all that means is big mind has transcended the small separate self mind. And so big mind means an experience of ultimate unity with the entire universe. That's what a big mind experience is. But it's actually, in terms of physiology, the big mind is a direct heart experience. And heart experience is inherently unified. And that's why when you're feeling the heart, you can feel a a great deal of closeness with other people. And so that's a heart experience because when you feel another person, you're not feeling them as a separate set apart person. You're feeling a state of unity or love with them. And so that's what very heart based experience and love is the core of the unitary experience because that's what you feel when you're in love. You know, even if you love a particular piece of cake, you love it because you love it so much, you're becoming one with the taste of it, one with the flavor of it, one with the whole cake experience, so to speak. Um, So love and unity experience are virtually identical. And so that's why when you drop into the heart, and you're feeling this enormous love of everything that exists. You're feeling a oneness with everything that exists. That's why you love it, because you're one with it. And you feel that oneness. So you can actually feel that loving unity. And that becomes a very, very powerful experiential realization. Um, And, of course, it's emphasized in a lot of spiritualities, like Christianity is known for its loving embrace of the world and other people and so on. And Buddhism and Hinduism don't talk as much of love as they talk of compassion, which is essentially the same thing. Compassion is you feel a compassionate caring for others because you're one with them. And so, of course, you want to take care of them and you feel a compassion towards them. Um, so love and compassion are two very powerful core experiences of the unity Satori experience. What's changed? In the last 10 years, we've had all kinds of new understanding of consciousness, fMRI, brain scans, EEG, uh, things about the quantum spin of protons in, in right. the brain. I mean, it's so interesting. So what has caught your eyes the most wow in the last 10 or so years? Yeah, well, I think the things that have impressed me in my awareness has been the increase in technology or brain mind machines or brain heart machines. Um, I just was surprised how effective and how quick they can affect brain waves and brain consciousness. And the more people have even small sort of unity experiences, they're going to be aware of any type of theoretical position that gives some sort of explanation to that unitary awareness. And that includes, most famously, quantum mechanics. And I've always been somewhat suspicious of people that write about quantum unity as being the foundation of Satori unity. Yeah, me too. They're just, it's not quite there. Um, 
and they like to quote Schrodinger and Heisenberg and De Broglie and Eddington and all of these founding physicists because the founding physicists all had an understanding of the unitary field of the universe. Um, at least one way to interpret quantum field is as a unitary patterned awareness. And so a lot of people started putting them together with quantum mysticism and it, there's just the actual amount of evidence that supports that kind of interpretation of quantum mechanics is very, very thin. It it definitely drives me nuts because people, you know, here's my quantum bathtub and, you know, they, right. they just throw it around. At the same time, I, I saw a study in the last year or so that did show that for the first time they could look at um, the spin of, uh, of protons, if I'm remembering right. Uh, in a living brain. And they found that every time the heartbeat, they would change their spin all simultaneously, which is really strong evidence that we are a quantum system. In fact, it's almost undeniable. And then you look at the HeartMath Institute work. I used to be an advisor years ago. They'll show you that you walk into a stall with a horse. The horse's heart rate variability will change to match yours, which is why tweakers can't ride horses. They throw you off because you're, you're, you're unstable. Now, is it a magnetic field or is it a quantum field or an information field? No one's actually measured that, right? Is it a, a decent supposition that when you have a chance, uh, an experience of oneness, that you become more quantum entangled and, and resonating with reality or other people or things around you? And that that's a communication mechanism for collective consciousness. I, I can't say that it is that way. I think there's more evidence than there used to be, but we don't know for sure. W would you agree with that or would you just still be more skeptical? That's what I mean when I say I'm a bit skeptical is many theorists talk about this as if there's hard evidence that this is the fact. Now, there's hard evidence that quantum fields exist and there's hard evidence that unitary states of consciousness exist. But there's very little actual evidence that quantum or that unity consciousness has a quantum state foundation. Because like you say, hardly anybody's even measured what's going on in those states. And while there is some more <clears throat> inferential types of awareness about this stuff, there's not very much of it as you yourself have pointed out Let, let's talk that about, always has bothered me yeah so. it it's always bothered me too and i i've had a few people come on the show with products that, that they make quantum claims and the products provably work right yeah. so i can't say they work via quantum but that's how they think they work and they might work by quantum but as long as they work i'm okay with it because sometimes yeah. you don't you know, we, we might not know why walking works. We just think we know, but there could be a whole magical thing we haven't figured out yet. So it's always a theory, right? I know that unity states of consciousness exist. Right. There's an enormous amount of evidence that those are real. They exist. Thousands of people worldwide have had these direct experiential realizations. And entire movements are based on the discovery of these, the entire Zen and entire Buddhist movement. And in fact, mystical religions around the world oh, wow. all depend on and they have practices that produce unity consciousness. And there's just no questioning the reality of that. But the number of people that have measured the actual state and come up with some sort of quantum field, uh, that's pretty well, we, rare. We suck at measuring quantum fields is the problem. Right. And what, what I find is that when people are having those kind of experiences, I can measure the electricity coming off their brain and I can right. use that as a guide to help the next person get into this state more quickly. Right. But that's an electrical field. It, it's a pattern of, of electron signaling in the brain that probably has a quantum signature that I can't measure yet, right? Um, I imagine that. in the next 15 or so years, we'll actually have quantum neurofeedback where we'll be able to measure the quantum spin in your brain. You'll be able to 
sit there and think of that image or whatever you do that changes the the spin and all of a sudden, you know, you'll be walking with angels or something. I have no idea. Well, we'll probably get there with our imaging so you could provide feedback on it, but we just, we're not that close and Neuralink isn't going to get us there. Speaking of Neuralink. That's right. <laughs> and I think that that will happen. And I think that we will get almost computer screens of the state of our brain. Yeah. And so we can see when we're getting closer to a unity state. We, we have that today, sort of, electrically, but not quantumly. Right. Right. Um, have you ever done a, a, quant, a quantified EEG, a QEEG on your brain to see what your brain's doing in there? I've done several different electrical-like measurements. And one that... Um, was really interesting is I had a small version of an EEG machine yes. and I connected it to my brain and it took me about two hours to put the machine together. And when I finally got it together and turned it on, what came up was an incredibly deep and profound theta state. Yeah, because I had been concentrating so intensely for two hours, and so my brain had already worked itself down into a very deep, concentrative, low wave-like um, state, and I could just see it on the screen. It was just alarming to me because I thought, oh, I've got to work to get into this state. But I had been working for two hours in a meditative like state of awareness. And so um, I've had several of those types of experiences. And one of the theories that has been suggested to me is that uh, when you're in, um, a deep sort of unity state. You're in some sort of deep theta yeah. state, essentially. That, that's and, what my research also leads to. Right. You learned how to get there naturally, kind of all by yourself when you were young. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and that takes several years of practicing to get into that deep meditative state. Um, it, it's, I want to point out for listeners, uh, before you continue on that thought, um, there is a type of theta state where you're dreamy, like, like you were traumatized, right. you're, you're caught in daydreams, you can't focus, you can't get things done in right. the world. That's not what we're talking about. No. We're talking about an intentional theta state where it's more downloading information, access to Akashic records, uh, an inner knowingness. Am, am I reading your state right on that? That's generally known Okay. as the fate of formless state. Because formless means no thought, no images, no pictorial thinking going on. It's an actual formless state of emptiness. And that is a very profound state to get in. But you're right, it's not a dream type of state. It's frequently called a deep dreamless state right because there's no dream uh, or anything any thought process going on i i think joe dispenza who's also been on the show calls that nothingness you, you step into right. nothingness i call That's it the right. unmanifest at 40 years zen but it, it's a weird state where um it, yeah it's it's like dark but there's nothing in it and and, right. and you you can make something out of it but it's very hard to use words to describe it uh, and I, I like the way you're describing it, is that kind of a, a dreamless dream state. Let's actually <laughs> call it shunyata, which is a Sanskrit word that means emptiness. And the first great founder of Mahayana Buddhism, which is the second major form of Buddhism after its beginning or founding form, which is generally called Hinayana. And Hinayana just means small boat, and Mahayana means big boat. So the Mahayana people chose the big boat term to refer to their process, and they used the little boat term to refer to the original type of meditation. But both of them, result in a state called shunyata, uh, 
which Nagarjuna introduced. He was the second major founder of Buddhism. And Nagarjuna gave very explicit, detailed instructions on what that state of emptiness was and how you got there. And he had a whole philosophy based on it, which was if you take any definition you want for ultimate reality, like it's radical formlessness, or it's a God consciousness, or it's a unity consciousness. Nagarjuna took dozens of those types of descriptions, and he showed, if you want to say that God is a theistic being, for example, Nagarjuna, because he was based on an absolutely formless emptiness belief, he would show that ultimate reality can neither be described as theistic or non-theistic or both or neither. And those four emptinesses constitute the overall emptiness of the world. And so you cannot say it's God, or you can't say it's not God, or you can't say it's both, or you can't say it's neither. Nagarjuna would shoot all of those down, and very effectively, I mean, very logically in that sense. Um, And that's what he was doing, was giving an outlet for all forms of mystical realization, because all of them are formless or expose um, an emptiness. Um, And those are often called godless or trans god or godhead or other terms that try to get those points across. But Nagarjuna wouldn't allow even those types because he would show that it's neither god nor not god, nor both, nor neither. So that pretty much eliminates all your possibilities that you can state it. It it sounds kind of quantum. Like, well, it's not yes, it's not no, it's sort of kind of in the middle, but not really there either. And it's like every time you look, it moves until you end up going into whatever that space is, where every time you look, it moves, and eventually you're looking and it moves, it doesn't matter. Um, And there were some founding quantum physicists, most notably Erwin Schrodinger, who wrote entire books. He Once he had this sort of – he was instrumental with Heisenberg in formulating the quantum principles. And he particularly showed – like Heisenberg used a very complex S matrix to indicate how to – describe ultimate reality. And Schrodinger showed it can be reduced to a simple, what's now called a Schrodinger wave. It's a simple wave function. And once he got onto that, he eventually, of course, stumbled into the Upanishads. And he would use massive numbers of direct quotes from the Upanishads to describe his version of what the Schrodinger wave equation demonstrated. Because what it demonstrated was an absolute nothingness. And that was yes. known as shunyata by the Upanishads. It, it's very interesting. Some of the early quantum physicists, even Edward Teller, you know, the guy who built the bomb, yeah. He quoted the Bhagavad Gita when they set off the first right. form. Like these guys were all studying it, esoteric Indian stuff yeah. <laughs> while doing quantum physics. And, right. and it, it's fascinating uh, and that you also studied that and you studied quantum physics as, as a right. part of getting into integral theory. Yeah. Now, I have to ask you this. I, I, as an interviewer, I already know, I think, what integral theory is. I've, I've read some of your books. Sure. Uh, but when I, w- if I were to try to describe it to someone, I would probably butcher it because it's it's one of those things where every time you try to explain it, you missed it. Almost like right. our whole conversation here. How do right. you, when someone in an elevator walks up and says, "Huh, what's integral theory?" Explain it to me like I know nothing. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, I would say it's a philosophical way or a particular way of thinking that shows how all forms of mere thinking don't really work. And they can be demonstrated to not really work. But another way to say that is that all forms of thinking take a different perspective 
on the same thing. So if we, if we include all forms of philosophy, we get something that's called the perennial philosophy because it refers, it unifies all of our different perspectives into one wholeness. So we have a subject in singular form and we have a subject in pluralistic form. So when we talk about your state of consciousness or my state of consciousness, that's a first person singular approach to consciousness. And But we have second person and third person perspectives. And we even have different pronouns with I, we, us, ours, they, them, he, she, it, and its. And those Major perspectives constitute what I call the four quadrants because there are four of those major views. So the upper left quadrant views a first person singular. So it's pronouns like I, me, mine, and so on. And then you can take that individual singular perspective, which I call the upper left quadrant, and you can see it in its plural form. And then the plural of I is we. And that includes us and ours and things like that. And those are first person plural. So they're what I call the lower left quadrant. So the upper left quadrant would refer to studies like psychology or the individual study of an individual consciousness. And the lower left quadrant studies things like societies or cultures or group collective forms of consciousness and awareness. And that that's, um, includes a you awareness. So that's the second person, you, thou, thine, and so on are all second person or plural perspectives. And then there's a third person, which refers to the upper left and upper right quadrants. So they include things like he or her um, or it. And then the lower right refers to third person collectives. So that includes um, something like systems theory, um, and it includes its, I-T-S, or the plural form of a singular it, which is the upper right quadrant. And so those include things like individual quarks, individual atoms, individual molecules, individual cells. Those are all looking at something from an objective perspective, either a singular, like the upper left is a singular I, or a plural, which is the lower right, like the lower left is a plural I. So it's a we or an us or or so on. And the lower right is an objective plural. So it's a they or a them or an it's, I-T-S. And what's interesting about those four perspectives is that we already have pronouns for each of them. So we develop those pronouns over thousands of years by referring to what they actually represented. So there is an I, a me, and a mine because there's actually an individual state of consciousness. And there was a we, an us, an ours, because there actually were plural I's. So there was an actual us or ours. And then we could also look at any one of those from an objective perspective. So when we look at an individual whole on, a whole on is a whole that's a part of another whole, and everything in the universe is made of whole ons. That's a basic tenet of integral theory. So I got that tenet from author Kessler who in The Ghost in the Machine wrote about what he called a holon, and all holons exist as a whole that's a part of a yet larger whole. 
And so quarks are whole lines for atoms. Atoms are whole lines of molecules. Molecules are whole lines of individual organisms. And the plural of an individual organism is a species, a collective form of consciousness. And so we have these I, we, it, and its pronouns because over the millennia, we developed them to represent real things in the real world. That's why we had actual words for them. That's why we have an I and a we and a he and a her and an it and an its because those things really exist. And so one of the ways that we talk about integral theory is we talk about including all of our perspectives on reality. And since there are major philosophical schools, you can demonstrate that each of those schools relies on a particular quadrant. So empiricism generally relies on individual I empirical experiences, and hermeneutics is the art and science of interpretation, and interpretation is a group of symbols that we use to interpret many different collectives, and that's the lower left quadrant. And then we have... um, individual objective realities, which is particularly includes most forms of science and their methodologies. Um, so science particularly focuses not so much on an I consciousness, although there are forms of psychology that do that, but it also depicts an I as seen from an objective stance. And that's things like an atom or molecule or an individual cell, an individual organism, or multiple cells and multiple organisms. Um, And those are the upper right and the lower right. So an individual it and a plural it. And there are types of methodologies that have been created that give access to each one of those four quadrants. So we have empiricism, hermeneutics, art, and systems theory, for example. And those are very real methodologies that you can use to gain access to one of those realities. And all of them are very real. How would I use it? Um, would I, so let's say that I'm working on uh, studying, say, hypnotism, or, or I'm just picking so, or acupuncture, right. something like that. I would then sit down with that. I would take integral theory and I would say, what perspectives of integral theory from all four quadrants can I use to understand what I'm focusing on and then get a deeper and more connected understanding of it and how it fits into the whole? That's right. Because once you have like four quadrants, And you have different fundamental particles making up each quadrant. Then you have access to four fundamental types of realities. And all of those are real. And you can use their methodologies to give you access to them. So when you study hypnosis, for example, you can study it from the upper left quadrant or you can study it from a so-called first-person perspective, and then you'll try to figure out what is the person directly experiencing when they're in the hypnotic state. And that will be a very real experience. And so that's your I state of consciousness that's having an hypnotic experience. But you can also look at that I state from the outside in an objective fashion. And that will give you the upper right or an it state. So from the objective viewpoint, hypnosis is an electrical brain wave. A particular type of brain wave. And a brain wave is an objective reality. It's not 
particularly subjective, except if you experience it, it's experienced as a subjective first-person experience, and so you'd call it an I state. But when you're just studying it as an exterior event, it's an object, and you see it as an object. So maybe you actually measure the brain waves, the electrical brain waves that are producing that state. And each of those, the I state and the it state, have plural forms. Oh, so yeah. we have, we also have like cultural consciousness and where we have experiences of what sometimes called a social organism right. or a collective group. And then you can look at those in, in an objective fashion as well. And you have not only um, the subjective state, you have an actual objective event. And we often call those they or them or its experiences. And that's what happens when we look at an individual brainwave in a large number of people. And so we'll get a social yeah. objective view. Uh, so there are important things that you learn about hypnosis, whether you're looking at a group hypnosis or an individual hub hypnosis or a subjective hypnosis or an objective hypnosis. It takes, I'd say, many hours of study to get a full understanding of how to use uh, integral theory. And, and for listeners, I, I was like, what's the best example? So when you talk about the I, it's right. a sensation. Or I'm feeling irritable or, or an emotion. Right. You look at the it, you're saying, well, it's a limbic system or a, a reptilian brain system or something. And when you talk about we, it's myths and magic and rational things like that. You're talking about it's, it's galaxies and planets all the way to communities and groups. And it, it is mind bending to study integral theory. I'm not an expert on it, but I, I've certainly read your books. It, it's, it's yeah. a bit of a, a mind warping experience to go deep with Ken yeah. Wilber, even just to talk with you. Right. And yeah. So, listeners, if you've never read any of Ken's books, uh, his, his newest book uh, is going to be worth your time. What I find is that when when you're you're learning from your elders, people have more wisdom than you do. I'm I can do what I do because in my my mid twenties, when my brain was trashed, I hung out with people in their eighties who were doing anti aging before it was acknowledged to be possible, and they taught me what I know. And right. so I got this huge leg up, and I always want to talk with masters and. The later the book in your 30 books, the more distilled wisdom will be in it because, and that's why it's easier for you to write books because you have more wisdom, right? Because yeah. you can see more clearly. And, and so right. you want to read the later books by Ken Wilber. Right. And if you're a biohacker and you're completely unaware of Ken Wilber, look, personal development is integral to biohacking because once you get your cells working right, they themselves have a collective consciousness. Now we're getting into the it's of biohacking, Right. And then you get up to the it, which is probably looking at mitochondria and, and things like that. And those generate the eye, at least in, in my understanding of it. So you need to read at least one Ken Wilber book uh, in order to call yourself a biohacker, I, I would say, because it, you cannot separate the body from the mind from the spirit. And you were like, well, of course you can't. So I spent, you, actually you spent 60 years <laughs> figuring yeah. out how to put all that stuff together and you're still going strong which I find impressive. I got to ask you though, after 60 years of studying consciousness, are we living in a simulation, Ken Wilber? Well, it's certainly, we're living in a type of experience that lends itself to that type of description. So you'll often hear people that are very familiar with computers say, well, we're just, this is all a simulation. We're all living in a computerized, externalized worldview. And the only reason they can get away with that is they're describing one of the quadrants. And to the extent that we look at the objective world, we are, there is a very real perspective from which that objective world is a projection of our own consciousness. It's a third person 
experiential reality. And all these objects are real and they're there and they're external to us. And we can trace their origins back to subjective experiences as well. So again, the four quadrants are there from the Big Bang all the way to stages of evolution. And that's what each one of my books sort of takes a different version of the universe and explains how all four of those perspectives, first person, second person, third person, um, have a reality. And they're very real realities. Are you familiar so, with, with Donald Hoffman's work on the user interface theory of reality? Um, no. But it sounds right. familiar. You've got to read his book on this. It'll, I don't want to say it'll blow your mind because uh, your mind's yeah. already been blown since you were a kid. Uh, yeah. But it'll, uh, it'll, it'll plug in. And, and his theory, if I numb it down, is that we evolved to create a user interface on reality because right. unless we're in the wholeness state you talk about, you know, I, I'm seeing you on my screen, but I'm not right. seeing the individual electrons that are transmitted over right. Google fiber optics and all that right. stuff. So I'm, I'm seeing a, a picture of you inside my brain that isn't right. you. And so you could argue that we're living in a simulation, but your body and your brain generate the simulation of mm -hmm. what's really going on out there. Yep. That's is, right. Okay. Well, and, but you can still take that perspective of an objective view. And when he's describing the user interface, that's the reality he's describing. He's describing a third person reality looked at through a third person perspective. Right. So he's giving you a third person description of this third person reality. And that third person reality is, in a sense, a projection of our subjective brain state. Because wow. we can take that first person perspective of it. And then we can look at that first person itself from a first person perspective or a third person. We can look at it from a subjective perspective. And we can also look at it from an objective perspective. And when we introspect, what we're doing is taking our subjective experience and looking at it objectively. So we're actually looking wow. within and seeing our subjective states. And those all appear as objects. So again, all the perspectives we can take have a foundation in one of the four quadrants. And they're all very real realities, which is why we can take these very real perspectives of them. So, so I, I believe that every time you read a good book, whether it's a good science fiction book or a right. Ken Wilber book, it gives you a, a new user interface to reality and a new right. way of seeing reality. So the more books you read, the more user interfaces you can switch between. And when you go right. deep with integral theory, that is kind of like a master switch to help you flip between ways of seeing things instead of seeing them only through an emotional or an eye perspective right. and and to be able to see them all simultaneously. Now, it, next time I'm in Denver, if I bring my QEEG machine, would you be up for letting me look at your brain waves? So it takes about an hour and there's no, not even any glue to mess up your hair. It's, it's a, a 3D printed cap. Most of the great masters, uh, especially spiritual guru types uh, that I've managed to, to get brain scans from, uh, most of them actually you can't get a brain scan when they go into the really deep states. The equipment just gives you static. It's like you go somewhere where the equipment can't see you anymore and it drives me crazy. Do you do that? Yeah. Um, well, the one sort of immediate experience that comes to mind is I use this, this small computerized brain mind machine and I would get myself into different states of consciousness. And one of the few states that I could reliably both get in and get a reading from was the witness state. 
And for those who aren't familiar with Vedanta or Buddhism, the witness state is often called the fourth state of consciousness because it's the fourth, it, it's just very unimaginatively called the fourth state because it's actually the fourth state. The right. first state is waking, then the second state is dreaming, the third state is deep, formless, dreamless state. And the fourth state is the ever-present witness that's looking at each of those states. So if you just right now look within and just get a sense of yourself looking at your small self, what's doing the looking is the witness. The witness is the big self, capital S, or it's called the Turiya, which is the Sanskrit for fourth. Because it's, it's the fourth state after the first three states that Vedanta recognizes. And uh, whenever I would get in to that witness state, and what I soon found is that I was almost always in the witness state. Because it would show up as an ever-present baseline on the computer screen that was always functioning. No matter if I was in first person, if I was in the first person state, I'd see um, like alpha or, or beta waves. Right. I'd see a lot of those. And then I'd see this very bottom, very low level theta state. Right. Which was like a first or second wave phenomenon. It was a very, very deep theta state. And then if I switched to a second person state, I just see the first person would disappear and there wouldn't be any third person. There'd just be a second person state of consciousness, which was um, theta, beta state um, and not an alpha state. Alpha was first person. Um, but I see the second person band and then I still see that very basic witnessing stance. It was still there. And the same thing when I would get into like a third person, sort of specifically formless state, I was witnessing that formless state. So there'd be a third person state and then there'd still be that same bottom witnessing band. And I just found that I was almost always, because I had practiced meditation and witnessing so long, that it was just kind of an ever-present state that was conscious. And I, that always surprised me. And I was very proud of it, which is sort of counter the whole state itself. You're not supposed to feel an egoic sensation like pride. So I wasn't too happy with that. Um, here's, here's a Zen Cohen that, that I invented. Uh, at least I think it's a Zen Cohen. And it's one of my favorites because it messes with my brain all the time. But your ego is smaller than my ego. Yeah. <laughs> which, of course, makes your ego go up, which then right. makes it not smaller. And it's like, no. Right. Uh, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that leads, yeah. though, to the and idea. I, of, and further, I'm proud of that fact. Exactly. And it takes you out of <laughs> a state of small right. ego. So right. how, do you, how do you deal with spiritual ego? It seems like that's the hardest one to deal with. And it's taking down great masters and gurus. So what's your personal practice to not be like, I am the great Ken Wilbur. Everyone look at right. me. What would take you out of your witnessing state? Yeah, um, that is a difficult one. And I found of all my various religious practices, and I've done practices from virtually every major form of spirituality. So I've done Vedanta and all three types of Buddhist meditation and Christian mystical tradition and Jewish Kabbalah tradition. And I mean, I, I, I just had an enormous um Ex experiential revelation of those. And the one that I found handles this problem the best is Zen. And I, I mean, it, it's just sort of a cliche to say that because Zen is such a powerful inducer of shunyata or an uh, emptiness experience, a nothingness experience, an ultimate turiya or even turiya tida, which is 
in most of the mystical traditions of the East, there are five major states of consciousness. The first, second, and third are referred to as waking, dreaming, and deep formless sleep. And then the fourth is Turiya, or the pure ever-present witness or awareness itself. And then the fifth is called Turiya Tita, which is a Sanskrit term that simply means beyond Turiya. So it's called the fifth state because it's beyond the fourth state. And the experience there is that you are deeply aware of the fact that you are aware. So it's also described as a, a great sense you're witnessing because you, you have an, a, a close contact with the ever-present awareness of the witness, but you're also witnessing the witness. And so that, in a sense, wipes out any separate subjective feeling. Because the moment you're a big subject aware of that small subject, that small subject tends to just go away. It it seems like it's generating an infinite loop in the brain because you witness right. your witness, then you witness your witness of your witness, and eventually your brain is just witnessing, and eventually you go into this state of oneness because right. you realize nothing's going on. And I, That's right. Yeah. Okay, so, so and I'm you on fall right. out of the witness itself. Right. Because you're witnessing the witness of the witness of the, so, oh, what? I forgot, and it's just gone. Right, and then you launch into that. And it, it feels like for me, the, the first, or at least the, the easiest way to get to the first step is any form of biofeedback. And yeah. it can be just a temperature sensor on your finger or stress response right. or heart rate variability, or my favorite obviously is neurofeedback, but even blood flow uh, training in the brain, all of those things. Um, that's the first level when it's like, oh, look, like I'm watching myself watch myself. And, and then that's the first one. And then you go, well, what part of me is watching me watch this? And that can be the, the launch pad to get into this this magical state. Um, right. Talk to me about drugs. I mean, you, you've hung out with all of the great masters of psychedelics, and, and now they're coming into it on trend again and maybe being a, a little bit more legal. What's your experience with psychedelics and consciousness? Because I went to that period where I first got introduced to the perennial philosophy thinkers, a fair number of the modern perennial philosophy thinkers, Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, people like that, had taken, not only taken drugs, at least mescaline, but often uh, psilocybin and an LSD, but they had written books about the entire experience. And they've also had separate mystical experiences. Yes. So they would compare the two. And what I found is that almost all of them felt deeply that when they had a very profound psychedelic experience, it was indistinguishable from the deep mystical experiences that they had had, even when they weren't doing drugs. Correct. So it was very believable that, that their psychedelic experience was very close to a deep mystical experience. But all of them would, in a sense, warn away from psychedelics because they would simply say, well, it's too much of a shortcut and it cuts out, it frequently cuts out too much of the full mystical state. So I always had uh, both a, a profound respect for the psychedelic experience because it could induce types of mystical, right. authentic mystical experiences. But I was always sort of shy of getting really into them because of the warnings that these great writers would almost always give you. Yeah. And they would say, no, meditate. That's it, what you have to do. It's, and it's, so thank I you started out um, and I first tried LSD. And it was, I had um, some very deep shadow stuff come up, which often happens in LSD. And there, if you just have the shadow stuff, it's called a bad trip. 
because it's just a full-fledged experience of your shadow. And that is a bad experience. And so I had some bad parts of the LSD experience, but I'd always come out of them and get the good stuff. So, yeah. But I only did like three or four trips on LSD because I felt that that was enough. Wow. And I didn't want to get into where it was detracting or thwarting my mystical experience. But thank you uh, for, for sharing that. And, and one of my concerns is that psychedelic therapy has great value. And I've had yeah. these mystical experiences without the drugs before I ever tried a psychedelic. Right. Actually, I tried mushrooms in my 20s um, one time. Uh, but it, it's one of those things where if you're relying on it and, you know, there, there's a, a guy out there uh, with a podcast says, oh, I've done a hundred ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh, I'm like, well, he's not in training to be a shaman in the jungle. It, it's some yeah. point, it's got to be, be a, the poor guy. It's not working. Right. Uh, right. So that's right. And, and then you have Stan Groff and I've been honored to actually co-host a breathwork session. Stan Groff used LSD in his in his uh, licensed psychiatry practice. And replaced it with meditation and breath work because you go to the same places. And, and I, I do that. I go to those places with electrodes on my head. You don't need the drugs. But yeah. maybe using the drugs once so you know the state is of value. But relying on them, it seems like too much of a shortcut. And I'm like the king of shortcuts. I, I'm biohacking. Like, get it done faster. Yeah. I don't know if that's the path. Yeah. Um, well, I'm um, good friends with Stan Groff. And yeah. I really appreciated his work early LSD were mm -hmm. um, very good. And it not only was it just really a profound research, it almost always produced exactly the great chain of being. So you, you went from really broken, egoic, fragmented experience to very real, unitary, unified, spiritual oneness. And Stan was always alerted by the LSD experience itself to those very deep unity experiences. I want to just mention that I, however, had a great deal of hope and promise for the so-called psychedelic revolution. And mostly for the reason you said, even if you can take one good dose of LSD and have a unity experience, at least you know it's there. Right. And it's real. And I had, that was my hope for the psychedelic revolution, even though I myself didn't continue doing that kind of drug. I'd had like one or two experiences of mescaline and a few experiences of psilocybin. And those all gave very unique types of mystical experiences, genuine mystical experiences. Um, but I was hoping that LSD in particular, because it was such a powerful psychedelic, that it would induce a sort of mystical revolution in America. And oddly, what seemed to happen instead is people would take it, and many of them would have a profound mystical experience, but they'd either fall into one or two of two different paths, neither of which were very helpful. One was they just take it like once a month and forever, so they would get up to the hundred times I've had the experience, and at that point, you're just wiping out it's just becoming much too um, almost symbolic. It, it just loses its reality and its real function. And, and the other way is that many people just stopped taking it entirely. And so we had this sort of two different branches, one people which were overusing it and another set of people which were underusing it. And neither one produced the middle of the road. I, I take it maybe two or three times a year, and I have profound experiences, and then I use those in my meditation yeah. practice to further it. And that just didn't seem to happen. Um, and I found lots of people that went one extreme or the other – 
But very few people that seem to balance out their use of psychedelics to prolong and increase their meditative experience. Yeah. And I, that was always very disappointing to me. It, it's kind of like, like when you wake up from a dream, you forget the dream until you tell right. someone to write it down. And I, right. I feel like there's a big challenge with integration after a psychedelic experience. Because if you write down and, and you were to record everything during that, and then study that in your meditation for a few months, right. um, you're going to get all the value. But if you just keep taking it and you forget 90% of it, it's not like your ego isn't listening. See, I think it strengthens the ego to take drugs yeah. over and over and over unless you do yeah. the integration. So your conscious brain gets it and your ego gets it. So you're at par with your ego because uh, we all know people who've done way too much yeah. ayahuasca or acid or something and right. something's not right and, and you can feel yeah. it, right? And, and I also know people who've done it maybe 500 times who are profoundly enlightened and just happy people and not that they don't have their little their scars or whatever but they're the exception not the rule right yeah uh, well, exactly um Very cool. and, and then there seemed to be a sort of resurgence of psychedelics when ayahuasca came along yeah because i talked to an enormous number of people that swore by their ayahuasca trip and they had taken it two or three or five or ten times. And they were having some very real and very profound mystical type of experiences. I, I kind of feel a little guilty about that. Um, in, the, in 1999, I went to Peru and I sought out ayahuasca. because I've, I've done extensive uh, reading like you. And I went down there and there was no tourism industry for this. And I... Yeah. Uh, and I asked them and they looked at me and they said, you're white. You won't like it. And I said, well, I, I know that yeah. I'm white, but I've done my research. I've, I've read DMT, the spirit molecule. I even know one of the guys right. in the study. So I was introduced to the right shaman and I, I had a ceremony. I didn't do it again for almost 20 years. Right. Yeah. But I talked about it a lot in the early days of biohacking in, in 2011, 2012, just as like one of the paths to consciousness. And, and there are certainly others who talk about ayahuasca. I'm not alone, but in, in the world of biohacking, I started biohacking. So I know that that helped to bring it out there. And I think there are predators using ayahuasca, especially on billionaires to try yeah. and kind of co-opt their consciousness. And like, it's not, it's, it's, it, it's with, it has risks. Even meditation yeah. has meaningful risks. Like Buddhist meditation in Buddhist literature can drive you crazy, especially fast right. Buddhism, right? That's right. So, so can I, so I'm, I appreciate your perspective on, you know, right use of these very powerful substances. So thank you, Ken. That's I right. think. You're a leading voice and, and people need to hear that. It, they're not good. They're not bad. They're yeah. somewhere in the middle, which is funny because you teach that. They're, nothing is all yeah. good or all evil, that, that everything is on a slider switch, right? Yeah. Um, is that part of non-duality? Do you believe in non-duality? Talk to me about that. Yeah, I, I think non-duality is a very good attempt at trying to state shunyata or it's neither God nor not God nor both nor neither. It's a psychedelic. Next no, it's, it's <laughs> well. you can't say it is or isn't or is both or neither. It's just emptiness. Period. And um, so that so I think Shunyata, particularly in the hands of somebody like Nagarjuna who sort of in, introduced it as a major conceptual formulation of Buddhism, which is to say it's neither conceptual nor not conceptual, nor both, nor neither. And he was always repeating those so-called four inexpressibles or the four negations of reality, although he would negate that and say, no, you can't describe it as four negations either. It's not. It, it, it's not that or not that or both or neither of that. So in his hands, it always left you in a state, something like uh, sunyata, something like emptiness, because you just it even blasted the notion of emptiness out of your mind because it can either be called emptiness or not emptiness or both or neither. And that sort of wipes it out entirely. And so you could come away with some pretty good experiential 
experiences from Nagarjuna. And I think that's why he is sort of single-handedly credited with founding the entire second major movement of Buddhism. He was the original Gautama Buddha. He was just a brilliant theoretician and a brilliant shunyata realizer or realization that it's neither A nor not A nor both nor neither. Um, and so um, I believe in shunyata or a uh, theory of non-duality. And by non-duality, Nagarshana means it It's neither dualistic or not dualistic or both or neither. Um, So he's just really getting rid of all forms of duality, although he would deny that that's what he's doing. Um, But that was, in effect, what he was doing. And your experience of satori or awakening or enlightenment is a feeling of non-duality to the extent it can be spoken of at all, um, because you feel that your subject is one with every object it's aware of. And that way your separate subject disappears and separate objects disappear. And everything that's in your awareness right now, this computer screen, this table, the chair you're sitting in, your own body, all of those are objects and they all disappear as something separate from you and your whole subjective awareness just becomes one with everything you're aware of and that's a non-dual experience although it's neither non-dual nor not non-dual nor both <laughs> or neither. Um, so as long as you sort of keep the real shunyata in mind um, I think non-duality is a very good approach to, to this ultimate reality. Wow. Ken, you are, uh, and I mean it in your introduction, a, a living legend. You spent uh, more time than almost anyone alive working on this. It's 60 yeah. years legitimately, uh, yeah. which, which just gives you an ability to, to communicate it in a in such a beautiful way. And, and it is a mind-bending thing. I mean, it bends everyone's mind, yeah. including yours, as far as I can tell. You're still getting on top of it. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm I'm so grateful that you're accelerating your your capturing and structuring of knowledge by writing more books more quickly right. and, and getting this level of mastery that almost no humans will ever do. Uh, so I'm I'm really excited to read Finding Radical Wholeness. I hope I get an advanced copy. And I know it comes out in April. So for listeners, I, I want to just remind you, pick any of Ken Wilber's books to read now. Ken, what is the number one first book people should read if they want to get into your work? Well, I actually think the one that I've just finished writing is probably the best overall summary of the integral approach. But it's not out and- yet. Yeah, and the reason is to what you've already described, that sort of each year as I use whatever my present theory is to look back at the previous theories, I sort of transcend and include everything I've done. So each successive work gets sort of more inclusive in terms of my explanation. So finding ultimate wholeness, it goes through five major different types of wholeness. So it goes through waking up, which is an experience of individuality, finite individuals with infinite reality or the ultimate unity experience. And then there's growing up. And and of course, that infinite unity awareness is an expansive form of wholeness because it's basically a oneness of the entire universe. And then we have growing up. And growing up is... Generally, well, it was introduced best by one of America's greatest psychologists. Not many people know his name, but his name was James Mark Baldwin. And he wrote around 1900, to 1912, 1920. And he was very good friends with William James. 
at Harvard. And of course, William James was writing books on states of consciousness. So right. William James wrote books like The Variety of Religious Experience. And he went through almost every great mystic in history and showed how they all had this similar ultimate unity experience. And so he was writing about altered states of consciousness. And what James Mark Baldwin was writing about was all altered structures of consciousness. And a structure of consciousness is different from a state of consciousness. Because a state of consciousness is a direct first-person experience. So if you have a waking state experience of being one with the entire universe, you know it. I mean, I'm one with it on, directly aware of that oneness. But stages of growing up are the actual stages that each and every one of us goes through as we grow through our multiple intelligences. So Piaget, for example, would describe them as six or seven major stages of development. And we start out with... um a type of natural intelligence of which Peter J outlined six stages. And even a cat gets to stage number four of those six stages because all of these stages that we go through are evolutionary stages that we went through as we evolved through the entire chain of being. So the full Evolutionary stages include quarks to atoms to molecules to single cells to multiple cellular organisms to the entire tree of life, from fish to amphibians to reptiles to mammals to humans. Um, and those are all experienced in their sensory motor form at these early six major stages of development, which all animals go through some version, they go so far up those six stages. Like I say, a cat reaches stage four and an ape reaches stage five or even stage six on occasion. Um, and then he, it goes to a stage that he called pre-operational. And this is because it's an early cognitive stage that can't actually operate on reality the way we do. Like when we're thinking about something, we're actually operating on that thing we're thinking about. So it's a mental operation, but we operate on our thoughts. And But pre-operational is before we do that. So in pre-operational, we still haven't differentiated subject and object very well. And that's a stage that's also called the magical stage of development. Because in magic, because subject and object are not well differentiated, if you change the subject, you'll magically change the object. And that's what all magic does. It manipulates the thought of, of uh, an object, and that actually magically changes the object. It's sometimes called word magic. So that's a magical stage of development, and we go through that. And then we get to what Piaget called concrete operational thinking. And that's it's also called a mythic stage of development. And the difference between magic and mythic is that in magic, which happens from ages two to four or five, we actually think that we can magically change things. So young children have what's called word magic, where they think that they can operate on and change reality and all of that. Um, and that's the pre-operational stage. When we get to concrete or mythic thinking, we can no longer do magic but some supernatural god or goddess can perform magic. So Zeus can perform magic, and Yahweh, God, can perform magic. And if we know how to correctly pray to God, we can convince him to produce magic on our behalf. So we think God can actually get us the new car or God can actually buy us something or goddess can make the crops grow 
And so our early mythic forebears would often do rites of sacrifice to the goddess. And those rites would induce the goddess to make our crops grow or some sort of mythic being that could perform magic. And so that runs uh, in human beings from around age six or seven all the way to around age 11 or 12. And at that age, 11, 12, 13, we shift to a stage called formal operational thinking. And that's thought that can operate not on the objective world, but thought that operates on thought. So we get the emergence of logic and mathematics and highly advanced thought forms like that. Um, And that produces multiple universal systems. So we have chemistry, biology, geology, and so on. And often those are so intense and experienced that they kind of fly apart. So they become, it becomes very hard for us to see how they're unified into one overall system. But if we keep cognitively growing and we grow to the next stage, which is often called polymorphism or pluralism, because it, it unifies all of these different pluralistic systems. So you have a, a unity of biology and chemistry, often called biochemistry, or we'll have a unity of geology and um, chemistry. So we have geochemistry. And so that's actually very unified forms of thinking. And thought can operate on thought to produce these very unified or global systems. And then if we go even further, it's usually called an integral stage because that takes any remaining fragmentations that exist in our thought and unifies all of them. It integrates all of our thought systems into a single unified integrated system. And that's often what systems theory, for example, operates from. So these are all important stages of our own growth process. And each stage is more inclusive. It transcends, like all stages we're aware of, it transcends the previous stage or it goes beyond it and it can do something that the previous stage couldn't, like concrete operational can operate on the external world and pre-operational thinking can't do that. And formal operational thinking can operate on concrete operational thinking um, and therefore produce unified systems, which concrete operational thinking can't do. So that's another type of wholeness, is the wholeness that we get from growing up. And each of us goes through the same types of stages if we continue to grow. Some people stop growth at an earlier stage. So some people stop growing at concrete operational or mythic thinking. Some people stop at formal. Many people stop at formal operational thinking. About 50% of people make it to a formal operational capacity. So they can do mathematics and logic and stuff like that. And then fewer people get to the pluralistic stage, which integrates those previous formal operational stages, and only about 5% of the population makes it to integral stages, which fully unifies all forms of thinking. And therefore, if you're thinking about different schools of philosophy, for example, integral thinking can integrate virtually every major school of philosophy. Um, And so that's waking up and growing up. And then there's something we call opening up, which um, everybody has upwards of around, psychologists differ, but around 12 multiple intelligences. So we have cognitive intelligence, which is our typical 
cognitive thinking in, as it goes through its various cognitive stages of development, pre-operational, concrete operational, formal operational, pluralistic, and integral. And each one of those gets bigger or more inclusive until you get to the integral stage, which is all inclusive. And each one of those stages transcends and includes the previous stage. So when you get the concrete operational, you're transcending a merely pre-operational thinking, which is just a string of symbols or symbolic words. Um, but it has access to all of those words. But it can operate on them and operate on the world around it in a way that pre-operational thinking can't do. It's just a magical type of thinking. Um, and in formal operational thinking is thought operating on thought, and that includes thought operating on concrete operational thinking, which is the stage that preceded formal operational thinking. And then pluralistic can include all of the different forms of formal operational thinking, and integral can include all of the pluralistic. It just gives a complete wholeness. So that's another major form of growth and wholeness. And then we have what we call cleaning up intelligence. And that's usually associated with the names of like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. And what happens according to all of the major cleaning up theorists, including both Freud and Jung, is that we all have a separate individual self-sense. We all have an ego or a separate self. And that ego can itself be fragmented or split off. So we can have a persona and it splits off a portion of itself called our shadow. And the shadow, all the shadow elements gather in the so-called unconscious. And we get it back by re-identifying with what is really part of our own thought system. And if we keep it split off, that separate thought shadow that we have is often projected onto other people. So if I, I might be attracted to a woman and have a lot of lust for her, but if I'm unaware that this lust is mine, I can project it onto her. And then I'll think that she is after me. Because that's what happens when we project some of our motivation is yeah. they get on. So if I'm angry at you and I project my anger onto you, I'll think you're angry at me. And that's what projection is all about. It's one of our major defense mechanisms. That, that's also where the roots of narcissism likely come from, right? That's correct. Um, and as for narcissism, what we want to do, narcissism can gets so intense that it splits off part of itself accidentally, and that becomes shadow material. So, and Freud was the first to spot this. Not many people know that the terms often associated with Freud, like the ego and the id, Freud never once used either of those terms. He used the actual German pronouns that are translated in Latin terms the I is translated as the ego or self, and the shadow is translated as the it, or as Freud, the Latin term that his translator used for Freud, both the ego and the id are Latin terms. And they were used to translate Freud's pronouns into their Latin forms. So, Freud would actually say things like, the I is often feels hurt or damaged from the it. And that's actually how they'd write it, the I and the it. And his major translator, James Strachey, translated those into Latin. And so in English, those Latin terms read the ego and the id. And so Freud's statement that the I is often hurt by the it would be translated as the ego is often hurt by the id. But that's not what Freud ever wrote. And so what he means is that the I has to reunite with the it. And the real master of doing this was a guy named Fritz Perls. 
who became very famous at Esalen Institute, which Mike Murphy had founded as the first, first growth center in America in the late 1950s. And by the 1980s, there were over 300 growth centers, all copied off of Esalen Growth Center. And one of the stars at Esalen was Fritz Perls. And Pearls famously said, I can cure any neurosis in 15 minutes. And what he would have the person do is they'd come up to work with him and he'd have them sit in a chair. And in front of the chair they're sitting in was just an empty chair, a chair with nobody sitting in. And so the person might say something like, well, I have this terrible anxiety and it's always overcoming me. And so they're actually using the terms I and it. It over, often overcomes me or the I. And so what pearls would do is have them put the it or their symptom, whether it's depression, anxiety, compulsion, uh, obsession, uh, depression, and so on, actually put it in the empty chair and talk to it as if it were a real second person, you. So the person with anxiety might talk to its own, Pearls would say, put the anxiety in that chair and talk to it. And so they'd say, okay, anxiety, why are you picking on me? And then you say, okay, answer it. So you play like you're the anxiety. You sit in the empty chair and have a conversation with yourself. And the more they would talk as the it, they were becoming the it. Because I'm, I'm not talking to my anxiety as an it. I'm talking to it as an I. Oh, I want to know why you're always feeling anxiety or whatever it was, but their I would identify with their it. So what Freud said where it was, their I shall become, that's what would happen. And the person would actually re-identify with their it shadow because they're now talking as if they were actually one with it. And that's why in about 10 to 15 minutes, their anxiety would start to go away because they're reintegrating right. with that feeling. And that's why Pearl said, I can cure any neurosis in 15 minutes. And even his critics agreed with him. Um, he I was know. amazed, fellow. That this kind of idea, it, it sounds kind of crazy. And, and what I found is that the body or the ego, whatever you want to call it, it does all sorts of stuff that's invisible to our conscious brains until we right. develop the faculty to see it. And then there are these mystical states, the ones that we've talked about, that allow you to go in and kind of change your settings. And, yeah. and that practice is a very potent way of doing it. And it, it on its face, it's entirely irrational when you look at it yeah. from the rational mindset. And just once you realize that a lot of what your body does is not rational based at all, it's right. motion based or it's based on phases of the moon or, you know, right. magnetic fields and all sorts of stuff. You just don't even know. Uh, so all of a sudden you can go in and change the settings. And uh, it's funny, uh, probably a, a seventh generation after that process is a part of the reset process I use at 40 years of Zen. There is an actual chair there and it's done with you know, neuroscience signals, but they visualize a thing in a chair because it's so powerful to bring and to reintegrate and to create when it, when it comes back in, you have a spiritual experience. It's a heart opening thing and, and all that. And, and I'm, I'm always looking for the faster ways to help people do that without using psychedelics. I don't care if they have used them. I don't care if they're going to use them again, but it, it feels like the really deep sensations I've experienced, the sense of oneness with the universe, they never came from psychedelics as strongly as they did from a process like that, where you just reintegrate as soon as it comes in, you're like, Oh my God, look at how big I am right now. And, and so I'm, it's very hard in a podcast to talk about these mystical states that there aren't words for unless you've been there and we agree on what the words are. And, and that's why Buddhism has, you know, 10 million words written uh, from the masters about it and they're still not done. And, you know, the, but, but I think this conversation is going to be very helpful for people who are saying, look, is all this mumbo jumbo woo nonsense or is there something? And I say, guys, Here's a master who spent 60 years studying this stuff. 
And Ken Wilber, you're different, but you're not nuts. I, I think few people would yeah. say you're crazy. Uh, you just have developed faculties that most of us haven't. And thankfully, you're teaching it. And I'm I'm so grateful for that. And I want everyone listening, guys, read Finding Radical Wholeness when it comes out. And I'll, I'll uh, definitely re-release this or I'll put out some stuff when your book comes out. In the meantime, pick up a Ken Wilber book or listen to some of the audios that you've got out there uh, because it's it's powerful stuff. And and I, I especially want to thank you for coming on The Human Upgrade and just sharing your wisdom with me and with all of our listeners and, and with the world. I, I genuinely appreciate you. Well, I, I've enjoyed this immensely and I'm delighted that you asked me to do this. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. 